morning, church. I want to share a scripture with you. Romans chapter 12, verse 10, reads, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Let's pray together. Father, as we open your word, we are reminded that it is perfect and sacred. We are reminded not to take lightly the reading of your word, for it is breathed out by you, Holy Spirit. We're also reminded, Father, that when we open your word, it is for our correction and our training in righteousness. In other words, it's for our benefit that we read your text and we apply it to our lives. We are not to read your text and simply try and manipulate the text to say what we want it to say. Remind us, God, that as we read your text, the purpose is that our character is adjusted to line up with your word, not the other way around. Your word doesn't change to fit our desires. We change to fit what the word of God has always said. An unchanging anchor, an unmovable landmark of what we are to do and think, say and not say, God, in your word, it teaches us how to be Christians, how to be followers of you, from how we are to worship and how we are to pray, how we are to think, how we are to act, what we are to do and what we are to refrain from doing is all listed in your word. And we ask you now that you would help us to have discernment so that as we look into your word, as we read these lines of scripture, we would have a soft heart to receive this text, to apply it to our lives, to make the adjustments if adjustments are needed and to receive encouragement if encouragement is what's needed. We are open and willing to receive from you. Thank you, God, that you are wherever we are. For you live within us. You dwell within us, Holy Spirit. So would you help us all to have ears to hear what the Spirit is about to say. For the Spirit inspired the text and the text is unchanged. And we have the author with us right now. Guide us, would you please so that we might apply this holy mark of a Christian. We ask all of this in Jesus' name, and wherever you are, you can agree by saying amen and amen. Well, I do welcome you to another time in the word of the Lord. We have begun a great summer series here in the church, and it's entitled Rules for holy living for our benefit. God has given us rules, commands, for how we are to live, for holy living. He told us to be holy like he is holy. Now we are imperfect and he is perfect, but our aim should be to be holy as he is holy. And he's given us rules for holy living. The very first thing we must digest is that all of these rules on on what we are to do have been set for our benefit. They are not to discourage us, but to encourage us. They are for our health and our welfare, not against us, but for us. There are a lot of rules that we have around us that are for our benefit, not to restrain us, but to protect us and watch over us. 
We would be quite foolish to think that we can do what we want, how we want, and interpret God in our own image and in our own insight and in our own understanding. It's a very foolish thing for us to think that God has not told us who he is and how he desires us to live. See, the mature person thinks that God is who he said he is, not how we want him to be, but who he said he is in the pages of your scriptures right in front of you. If God is who he said he is and not who we want him to be, then we should learn who he is. Same goes for who he wants us to be. It is immature for us to think that we don't have guidelines, that we live however we want to live, and we interpret our moral code on our own individual understanding. That is, that is an inappropriate understanding of following in the footsteps of our Messiah. Actually, we should, if we are mature, if we are wise, then we understand that God is who he said he is, and he's given us the clear, very clear instructions on what we are to do and what we are to refrain from doing. We don't have this broad road that we walk down. He actually told us it's a very narrow path that we walk. What you do have, however, is free choice. You have the right that God has given you and he's given me to do what he's instructed us to do or not to do. We have that, that ability to choose. Let's go all the way back to the Garden of Eden for a moment. One of the greatest pictures of love that God has ever given is that there was a choice to eat the fruit or to not eat the fruit. Now, God had told both Adam and Eve not to eat this certain fruit because it wasn't good for them. However, the picture of love is that they had their own choice whether to or not to do what God had instructed them to do. You know the story that they chose to do what was not good for them. And it has shown that it was terrible for them. It separated us from God by being disobedient to what he instructed us to do. However, we still have that free choice today, whether you submit to what God has instructed you to do or you choose to do what you want to do, what rules you set and forth. So here's the encouragement. You can't say that there aren't clear instructions because there are. However, you can say that you have chosen to follow or not to follow the said instructions set before you. That's what this series is all about. We have been given rules for holy living, but they're for our benefit. Now we're going to look through these rules. Now the, the section that the Lord is going to guide us through is Romans chapter 12. Beginning on verse 9 all the way down to verse 21 are a list of things that are the marks of a true Christian. We might say that, uh, again, we have our own moral compass. However, what God has told us is this, this is the guideline, this is the measure, this is the plumb line of what a true Christian looks like according to his wisdom not our own. So let's look at Romans chapter 12. Let's begin on verse 9 and let's read down to verse 21 and see what rules God has set forth for you and I to apply to our lives that we might have the marks of a true Christian, not just following our own preconceived ideas of what we think Christianity should look like or sound like or feel like. We have been given clear instructions. Let's go to the text. Romans chapter 12, beginning on verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. 
Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who bless or bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord, written by God, breathed out by the Holy Spirit, written down by the Apostle Paul for our benefit. It would be too much for us to try and digest from verse 9 to verse 21. Last week, we looked at verse 9, which told us that love should be genuine. We learned very quickly that that love was directed from us to God. Not from us to uh, those around us, but from us to God. It needs to be a genuine love. Do we really, truly, honestly love God our Creator? Then it told us to abhor what is evil, meaning it should be something that is disgusting to us. Things that are evil should revolt us. We shouldn't flirt with things that are evil. We should be repulsed by it. And then it said, hold fast to what is good. This is becoming more and more and increasingly difficult to hold fast to what is good, for the times are changing. Things that used to be uh, abhorrible have become commonplace. Things that used to be uh, unacceptable are now acceptable. We must hold fast and not feel the need, feel the, uh, the impulse to keep up with society. For society in and of itself has always been wicked, pursuing the comfort of self and not the desire that God has put before us. So we hold fast to what is good, what is timeless, what is truth. When we do that, we will stop drifting along with societal changes and we will be anchored in God. An unchanging, not moral code, but the law given by God. So we must love God genuinely Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. That was just verse 9. Today, let's look at verse 10 that reads, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Honor. If we learn to be anchored in verse 9, we learn that we must honor in verse 10. Notice that verse 10 begins by saying, love one another. Let's begin there. We know that we are to love. Actually, verse 9 told us to love God, to have a genuine love towards God. But now we're being told to love one another. An unselfish love because it's no longer simply about us. 
Often we, we think about our Christian life, well, selfishly. It's me and God. We are on this journey together. I talk to God. God talks to me. I am on this journey. And unfortunately, we think of this as being islands unto ourselves. That's actually, especially here in New England, we have become islands unto ourselves. We like our privacy and we like being independent. However, we are not islands unto ourselves. We are the children of God. We are a family. And he says here, I don't want you to just love me. I want you to love one another. It's hard to be an island unto yourself when you have to love one another. We do have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but we have also been told clearly that we are to love our brother, one another, those that fellowship with you, the brothers and sisters in the faith. Love one another. See, this is a far bigger priority than we think it is. Let me show you. John chapter 13, verse 34 shows us how big of a priority this love one another actually is. Let's look at that. John chapter 13, verse 34 says, it's Jesus speaking. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The sign that we are God's disciples is not miracles. It's not miraculous signs. It's loving one another. When there is division among us, it is, it is a sign that we are just like everyone else. For everyone has divisions. We've seen this in our nation. We've seen this in the churches. We've seen this in all different rows of business. There is division. There is destruction. There is people out for self and not people working together to love one another. We were told that the greatest example that we could possibly have as Christians is not that we heal all the sick or that we raise all the dead or that something supernatural seems to happen in the halls of the church building. Actually, Jesus himself said that loving one another by that simple practice alone, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Clearly, a priority to God. That this is our example to everyone, is that we love not just us to God. That came first. Notice first in verse nine, he said, let your love be genuine between us and God, but now love one another. By that, people will know that you are my disciples if we love one another. Ephesians chapter four, verse two says it this way. With all humility and gentleness and with patience, bearing with one another in love. If we come in to the halls of the church, to a, a new family, with our own preconceived ideas of, of how things should look or sound or feel, and we begin to get this very selfish mentality that we are right and everyone else, of course, is not, we can, even in the halls of the church, when gathered around you is your family, we can become islands to ourselves because we, we have this inappropriate thinking that we have it right. 
And we picture God the right way, and everyone else maybe doesn't worship the way that we worship, or think the way that we think, or discern the scriptures the way that we do. But notice that in Ephesians 4, 2, he said that we should be bearing with one another in love. Now, love is patient and kind. Remember that? But how often do we bear with one another, recognizing that none of us are perfect, none of us have it all figured out, and that we must bear with one another, working together, loving each other, supporting each other. This is why, back in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, he begins by saying to love one another. That's what he wants us to do. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Why that's so important is God loved us and we are clearly imperfect and he is perfect. So when you think of your brothers and sisters around you, the, the household of faith, the family that you know that worships together, if God loves us and we are imperfect, shouldn't we bear with one another who are imperfect? Here's the issue. People will come and try to find the church that suits their desires. We have a, a very selfish mentality of, of what church is. It's really all about us. It's no longer about God. It's about what you get out of the church. Do they sing the way I want them to sing? Does he preach the way I want them to preach? Do they pray the way we should pray? Do we fellowship the way that I think we should fellowship? And church has become about us. We try out churches for our personal benefit to see if they fit. This is our new foolish way of thinking that church is really about you. When of course, scripture says the church is about the one we worship. This is our time to honor God, not to get what we want out of it. However, here's what happens. If people will come to the church and they gather together and, and the minister says something that they don't like or the music is in a style that's not preferable to them, they leave the household of faith and they become islands unto themselves. They don't bear with one another. They think that those people are incorrect and they are correct. And what happens is they do become islands unto themselves. And the problem with that is there's very little correction when you're all by yourself. You begin to think however you want to think and no one is allowed to speak into your life. You have no opportunity to show love and to bear with one another and have patience with one another. No one's allowed to speak correction into you because they must be wrong. You, of course, are right. Do you see how this can lead to a very unhealthy, extremely isolated, unbiblical way of thinking. Christians all by themselves denying the gathering of the brethren where we come together and we worship together and we love one another. This is what God said to do. It wasn't my idea and it's not your idea. It's God's idea. This is what he told us to do, to gather and to love one another, support one another. When one is sick, we take care. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. This is the goal of the household of God. Love one another. So if you find yourself all by yourself, something is wrong. Find yourself gathered with the brothers and sisters in the faith, patiently, Bearing with one another, love one another, forgive one another. It is not okay when we find ourselves all by ourselves. 
God taught us to pray in a secret place, but to fellowship corporately. He taught us to have a personal relationship with him, but worship should be with the brethren. Let's make sure we don't have an unhealthy balance. You cannot formulate an excuse on why you don't love one another. There's nowhere in scripture that justifies isolation from the family of God. Romans 12, verse 10, love one another. But the next section says, with brotherly affection. Brotherly affection. Family. So now it's not just bearing with one another, there's a sense of family here, that it's not complete when one piece is missing. This is the, the right way for us to begin thinking about loving one another, that the church is incomplete when one of the pieces is missing. I want to show you what that looks like. Let's, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, 1 Corinthians 12 gives us a huge section about the idea of being the body of Christ. But I want to show you just a couple of key verses. 1 Corinthians 12, let's look at verse 14. It says, For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. It's not just about us. We are the family of God. A sheep fold. That's how we're supposed to look at it. So when one member is missing, something's missing. Let's go down to verse 19 in 1 Corinthians 12. If all were a single member, where would the body be? If we only had just the one, where would the sense of the body of Christ be here? We were never designed to be that way. The family is not just you. The family is not just you and your spouse. The family are those that have the common faith that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is what binds us together. And then we love one another with this brotherly affection. Let me show you again. If we go back to 1 Corinthians 12, look at verse 26. It says, the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So we are individuals before God, yet we are corporately the body of Christ. When you are missing, the body is incomplete. The church is incomplete when you are missing, for you have isolated yourself away from the body of Christ. Remember, it takes great patience to have a healthy family. Show me one marriage that doesn't rely on communication and patience and, and bearing with one another. This is the heartbeat of marriage. Think of your family. Your family doesn't always see eye to eye on every single topic. It takes patience and loving and kindness and gentleness and being slow to anger. This is how family stays together. Or if we only focus on our differences, then we would always be scattered. And we go back to what Jesus said himself, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. We love one another. We take care of one another. This is the example of the body of Christ in the broken world. So if you find yourself isolated, the church, the body of Christ, is missing pieces for we've isolated ourselves. I want to show you an interesting perspective on this, though. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. It says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, 
brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Now, notice it does say brotherly love in there, but I want you to see that it says to have a humble mind. See, a real family works through its differences. We have the law of God written down for us. This is the very thing that the whole church is based on. Not the opinion of a man, but the very words of God. However, the church is full of humans and humans are broken and this is why if we are stubborn in our mind we will immediately isolate ourselves but if we are humble in our mind we recognize that you might be broken and others might be broken and we are not quick to judge but quick to love do you see the difference how we must be quick to love one another forgive one another and be humble in how we think Humble towards how we think about ourselves. You're not always right. I'm not always right. However, we must be humble in our mind and our thinking so that we can love one another. Let me show you this. 1 John chapter 2, verse 9. 1 John chapter 2, verse 9 says, Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. If you say, I, can't, I hate that person, I can't stand that person, and you think that you are walking right with God, you are still in darkness. If there isn't forgiveness, a humbleness of mind, and a love for your fellow God-following person who is broken, by the way, but so are you, and so am I. If our attitude, which is what separates us as the family of God, if our attitude becomes that we, we think we're walking in the light, but we hate what that person said, and we are offended by what that person did, then we are not walking in the light when the bitterness of this rages in our spirit. You are not in the light. According to the Holy Scriptures, you are not right. Psalm 133, verse 1 says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Unity will never be accomplished when you come with your opinion. Because your opinion can never fully match the opinion of everyone else. If you come with that mindset, there is no church on the planet that you can be equally yoked with. You must come with the humbleness of mind. And the idea that you have come to worship God and I am going to love one another. This is how a God-fearing Christian that is biblically minded, thinks clearly about the house of God. Let's go back to Romans 12, verse 10. Love one another with brotherly affection, family. But then it says, outdo one another in showing honor. Do you notice that this continues to increase in its intensity? Let's look at it again. Let's look at verse 10. Love one another, very broad statement, with brotherly affection, refining, making it a family, and now outdo one another in showing honor. It's, it's not just family now, it's to honor one another. It, it's intensifying as the sentence goes on. First we love, then with family affection, now with honor. It continues to intensify. Honor. What is honor exactly, though? I want to show you in the Greek what the honor means here. The word honor is to me. To me is the Greek word for honor. And what it means here specifically is value. Value, as in like the price of something, it's value. 
So let's read that with the Greek thinking. Outdo one another in showing one another's value. How much value does someone have? And, and show, outdo someone. You have incredible value. And you have incredible value. You are so valuable. That's the word to me. To me. It's actually spelled, if you want to write notes, like we would spell the word time, T I M E, but it's to me. It's, it's value. Do we have value for each other? It's an interesting thing because we can show honor by how we speak about one another. So let's, let's think about this for a moment. How do you speak about others? Do you show them their value? Do you speak of their value? Not just when you speak to their face. I mean when you're talking about them and they're not around. Do you lift them up and explain their incredible value? Because, see, we can, we can show honor by what we say. We can also show honor by what we don't say. What about when someone has done something that's not good, not acceptable? Can you show honor by not bringing that up? Do you remember one of the commandments that God gave was to honor your father and your mother? Did you know that you can honor your father and mother even if they are no longer here on earth? By what you say about them and what you don't say about them. Maybe you had the greatest mother, like me. I have the greatest mother that's ever walked planet Earth. I can speak of her character and only gain her value because that's how I see her. She is a woman of incredible character. My father was a man of great honor and respect and dignity. So when I think of honoring my parents, my father is with the Lord. But how I speak about him today, I can honor him. My mother, who is with us now, I can speak of her and honor her for how I see that she walks out the scriptures, how she loves those around her and always puts others higher than herself. But what if, what if I recognize that my parents are not perfect? Maybe you had parents that were not perfect and you don't have that image of honor and dignity and, and love and respect. What if your parents were nothing like that? I am incredibly blessed to have two extraordinary God-fearing parents, but what if you did not? Can you show honor and respect to your parents by maybe not saying, maybe not speaking of the things that they did wrong or where you felt that they did not measure up to the standard of excellence. See, we can show value by not tearing down. How can we show honor to each other? That's what this verse is saying. He said, I want you to outdo one another. Outdo, meaning someone spoke about your value and how valuable you are and you outdo them by speaking about their value and how much value they have. Notice that neither person is tearing themselves down. See, we have a very inappropriate thinking about humility. We think that humility is lowering ourselves to lift someone else up. But there's nowhere in scripture that says to belittle yourself. It does say to lift others up. So let's first look at the idea of honoring someone by not speaking evil about them. Scripture says, Ephesians chapter four, verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up. We don't tear people down, we build up. 
If you don't have something nice to say, you've heard this before, that's right, don't say anything at all. When we are speaking about the, the household of God, the family, those, that, those of us that call Jesus our Father, we are brothers and sisters together, we don't tear each other down, we build each other up. I have nothing good to say, so maybe I don't say anything. That is showing honor. But now let's look at the idea of building value. If the Greek word tame means to, to build someone's value, it doesn't build anyone's value by me tearing me down to build you up. That's a very foolish and immature way to think about humility. If I want to honor you, I don't tear me down to build you up, I just build you up. And then to show value, to speak of, of the character that you have and the things that you have done. I build you up in your value. I honor you. It doesn't honor you to tear myself down. What we want to do is stop thinking about ourselves so much and begin to think about how we can build others, build the value, build honor in the house of God. What would happen, what would it look like if we built each other up? If we spoke about each other to, to create the value, the, the raising of the value and the honor in the house of God. Let me show you what real honor looks like. It's found in Philippians chapter two, verse three and verse four. Notice that nowhere in Philippians two, verse three or verse four, does it say to put yourself down. It does say to build others up. Watch and let's take a look. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Remember, humility is not tearing yourself down. It's building someone else up more significant than myself. So if we were to read Romans 12, 10 correctly, it says to love one another with a family affection, which means we go through the good times and we work through the difficult times. And we outdo one another in building each other up, in creating value, in showing honor. This is what we've been called to do. This are, these are the rules for holy living. And it's, it's the sign to everyone else that we are the children of God. What sign are you showing the world when you isolate yourself? You say, well, I believe in God, but I don't believe how any of them believe. I've got it right and they've all got it wrong and I do my own thing, my own way, because no one else understands God like I do. You have done all the things that scripture says not to do. You have thought of yourself more highly than anyone else. You have no love for one another. You have love for yourself. And you have not begun to have a brotherly affection where you work together to worship together. You have said, I worship as an island unto myself because I'm right and others are incorrect. If you find the church, where everyone sees everything exactly like you do, it'll be a church where you're the only one in it. Because out of the 12 disciples that Jesus had, hand-chosen, he spent all night in prayer choosing the right men. They came from all different walks of life. They bickered with each other. They did not agree on hardly anything. And he said, these are the men that I train, that I teach, and that I sent out. From different political views, 
We have a zealot in one side and we, we have fishermen on the other. We have tax collectors. We have, we have all different walks of life, all gathered together from the wealthy to poverty, all working together. And the only thing that united those 12 men was Jesus. Jesus himself. So what are the rules for holy living? Well, according to Romans chapter 12, verse 9 and verse 10, number one, we love God genuinely. We hate what is evil. We set our anchor on what is good. And we love one another with a brotherly affection, family. And we outdo one another in creating value in each other by showing honor. We love God and we love each other. Does that sound familiar? We, we love God first and we love each other. It sounds familiar to me because wasn't Jesus asked a question where point blank he was asked, what is the greatest commandment in the entire law? What is the greatest commandment that God has ever given? And Jesus didn't flinch at all. He answered the question. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. That sounds like Romans 12, verse 9. Let your love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold to what is good. Love God with all that you are. But Jesus didn't end there. When he was asked, what is the one greatest commandment? He said, to love God. That's the first. And then he said, but the second is just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Two commandments, not one. So if you are stuck in just the one, I only love God, I have no affection for those around me, I love God, then you have become unbalanced in the rules that God has set for holy living. We do love God and that comes first. And then Jesus said the second is just like it. Love your neighbor. And he said it's on those two commandments depends all the law. Remember, if you take the Ten Commandments, they are not separated in half. There are four and there are six. Four commandments have to do with us loving God, and the other six have to do with us loving our neighbor. There are four commandments that are vertical, love the Lord, don't have idols, keep the Lord's day. You know what these four are, but then the other six don't covet, don't steal, don't murder. These are between us and each other. We have become unbalanced in our understanding of rules for holy living when we understand that we should love God, but we have no affection, no desire to love one another because every one of us, you included, myself included, we are broken. And if we're looking for perfect people, you'll never find them. What we're looking for is a humbleness in our mind to not think of ourselves more highly than we ought, but to bear with one another with a family affection and work together to honor our God. How pleasing it is to God when we dwell together in unity. What is one of the ways that we please God in worship? It is not by isolating yourself as a bunch of islands that never communicate with each other. It is when we come together as the body of Christ and we are complete and in that place, we are not separated by all of our differences but united on Jesus Christ and Him crucified and He is worthy of all our adoration. He's worthy of our song, of our prayer, and of our adoration. Love one another with brotherly affection and outdo one another in showing 
honor. Father, we need divine strength to do this because we understand that on our own strength, we will not do this. In our own strength, we are guilty of selfish thinking. So we don't want to just hear your word, but not actually do anything about it. Help us to make the adjustments that are necessary. And adjustments are going to be necessary. Forgiveness is going to be necessary. Humility is going to be necessary. Patience is going to be very necessary. But you said that this is an example to the world. Not when we are individuals by ourselves, but when we are the body of Christ, with you, God, as our head, working together to honor you and to love each other. Would you show us what that looks like for us individually, that we are not merely individuals by ourselves. We are the body of Christ. This was your idea, not our idea. It doesn't work in our thinking, but you have great rules for holy living, and this is one, that we love you and that we love each other. This will be difficult to put to practice. Maybe it means that we reach out beyond ourselves. Maybe it means that we return to a place that we have left because we were offended. Maybe it means that there'll need to be some thinking highly about others and not so highly about ourselves. Maybe it means that we weren't always right. Maybe it means something unique to each one of us, but this is where we need the Holy Spirit to step in. Because, Holy Spirit, you live within each one of us, and it is your desire that we are working together, loving each other. So, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would enlighten each one of us individually to see what needs to be adjusted in us so that we can love each other. Would you give us the insight, the direction, the guidance, so that we can put to practice how to love one another like a family and to show honor to each other. God, one way that we can be united even right now is wherever we are, you are with us. Whenever we hear this, you are with us. And we can be united together, not in a space, but in a prayer. So united as your children, we pray together the prayer that you passed down to us. So with one voice, we pray back to you as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Well, God bless you all until we meet again.